Okay, so our next speaker is uh, uh, Stanislav Koryevsky. Uh, Stanislav is a professor of philosophy at the University of Warsaw. He's well known for his work on non-standard satisfaction classes, but uh, recently he uh, uh, did something else. He published a treatise on anti-mechanist arguments based on Gödel's theorem. Maybe it's also good to point out that uh, Stanislav's logical work is just a part of, uh, uh, yeah, what can I say, a much larger life. So uh, he, he is known for many other things than uh, for, for his work in logic. He has many publications uh, on the philosophy of religion. Moreover, he is a very prominent figure in the Jewish community of Poland. So it's really my pleasure to give the floor to Stanislav. Thank you very much, Albert. Thank you, the organizers, Yong Cheng, and all the other organizers for uh, having put this uh, conference together. I'm honored to be part of it. So uh, I have, uh, because there's a whole hour for, uh, for each speaker, which I didn't uh, know when I uh, offered my, my uh, abstract, I will do a richer uh, talk as you see then what I had announced uh, on various aspects of uh, philosophical consequences of incompleteness proofs, including the anti-mechanist argument, so-called, which has been so, so strongly and so often uh, demolished by logicians, but is still very much part of the general life of a Gödel's uh, theorems uh, for a larger public, uh, and I think you know uh, I can offer something that is a stronger refutation than most people, other people do. Anyway, let me uh, say the, what are the the points. So first, I will say something about not just limitation, because normally we think that Gödel's results give limitations to. Uh, axiomatization to formal or methods, etc. But there are also some constructive consequences. Uh, remarked by Bernays, the shape of pi one formulas, which is well known, and emergence in mathematics, which is something that I propose to consider, although this is not nothing, not, not really well known. Then the Lucan Penrose things, uh, the, the unknowability thesis, uh, which uh, was formulated by Gödel. And then they, finally the implementation project, uh, which means that this is the problem, whether we can define our understanding of natural numbers so that it can somehow be put into, uh, into computers, into you know, the, the machines that we have been uh, creating so successfully, we, the human, human, humanity. Now, uh, and finally, some remarks about practical irre irrelevance. Irrelevance, not relevance, or irrelevance of, uh, of Gödelian limitations. Uh, okay. Mm. Now, uh -huh. let me perhaps, so that I... Uh, it works probably nicer if it's done this way. Okay, so, so as I said, some constructive consequences. So the, what is the, what the Bernays remark was, was that the Gödel's uh, the discovery was like the discovery of incommensurability by Pythagoreans. What is meant by that is that, you know, uh, what, were, what was, uh, discovered is that the Euclidean algorithm for, for finding a common divisor runs indefinitely when we take two numbers or rather two segments whose lengths are not commensurable and it goes indefinitely. So in this, so the, the, what is the parallel? Namely consider, you know, in a formal, formal proofs in a formal theory of, uh, and normally if the theory is decided, is complete, uh, we have this decidability procedure, yes, that we consider formal proofs one after the other. And in theory, of course, not in practice, but in theory, if we finally find either the proof of A or the proof of the non of the uh, negation of A, 
Uh, but if it's uh, A is uh, undecidable, um, then the, we go indefinitely. Uh, so it's an interesting remark, I think, that shows that somehow, you know, it's a limitation, but it can be seen as a something positive in some sense. But this is just a, a little uh, uh, remark. But the fact is that it was not expected. The, this is something that we really don't understand, not don't appreciate anymore. But not only Hilbert, but also Husserl or Poincaré, they really did think that axiomatization, the proper axiomatization would be complete. And that's why it wasn't really, you know, of deep interest. So it was such a huge, and I think there will be talks here at the conference explain, explaining that, 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 that reality, how unexpected the, the, that was. Now that, the, as we know, it's not Gödel's, although he did part of the work, but the later developments, but they are well known that the pi one formulas can be seen as we know as the absence of solutions of uh, some specific Diophantine equations, uh, each formula for a specific Diophantine equation. This is well known and uh, it was possible to prove because of Gödel's, of Gödel's technique or methods. Uh, but it's important because now we know, we understand that we can see in some sense, at least those arithmetical formulas and even formalization of meta -theoret meta theoretical uh, properties as, as something that is just mathematical at least in some sense, a uh, problem or the uh, solution of a mathematical problem. So, co the, so especially consistency is of this shape. And if, and this means, uh, uh, so what is, the, what is the consequence? And this is the consequence that I will go look from various angles uh, in, in, a, in a few moments again, but basically, uh, if uh, if you know the the existence or the or the lack or the absence of of of, of solutions to a specific equation, the simple you know theoretically simple equation uh, is depends on the consistency of some theory, and this theory can be very involved, and it can be very unclear whether this theory is consistent or not. It would mean that the properties of natural numbers are not really that stable or those that clear, not really there before we really decide or we know or we somehow learn whether the consistency statement, the standard, standard consistency statement, is or is not true. Uh, that is whether the theory, some say complicated theory, is or is not uh, consistent, like we you know large cardinal theory in, uh, statements in set theory or something like that. So this leads some, especially Dummett was uh, put that in a very strong way, that there's nothing like the set of all natural numbers, that natural numbers are somehow uh, not a uniquely determined set, but just a, uh, a category of objects that is unfinished, developing, being created, that can be go this way or another. So this is really you know, one of those consequences that are, you know, formally difficult to grasp, but very uh, philosophically, I think, very important and deep. Okay. Now, so A and B we have done. Now this issue of emergence. So emergence in mathematics is not something that people normally talk about. What emergence is in more philosophical general way, namely these are the situations in the material world usually in which the growing complexity causes the appearance of essentially new features or at least provides an occasion for essentially new features to appear. Oh yes, it is, I have it uh, written down too. So the best, the, the best examples, the standard examples, like, like the emergence of life, you know, from the lower level, we don't see the 
upper higher level qualities. They are ungraspable from the lower level. So the emergence of life from the point of view of, of physical properties of matter or the emergence of the mind from the point of view of the biological the, uh, uh, or of consciousness of the bi biological uh, analysis of, of, of um, uh, beings, etc., etc. So, and so, and this is a, a general category, I think very interesting. And the, my question is whether there are any identifiable mathematical situations in which we can say that emergence of that kind, that is a completely qualitatively new, new um, uh, um, phenomena appear that are uh, impossible to predict or impossible to, to see, to, to, to imagine even from the lower level. So this is the question. And uh, of course we can try various things and uh, uh, various uh, definitions and uh, there is a whole there, there, there's a whole discussion is possible, which I I've done I've tried to do it. But anyway, the point is that I think that the best definition is psychological. That is the there is an in, it's there is a surprise when we go to the higher level. There is an inescapable inescapable surprise for from for the for us coming from the lower level, and. Uh, so it's more than, so it's sort of psychological. And perhaps one, one example that is so well known now, for example, are fractals, right? The fractal, the structure, fractals are, you know, defined in a very stable way, but then they have properties when we zoom into it, et cetera, which are really completely unexpected. And they are so unexpected that this is, a, the surprise is somehow impossible to overcome. And uh, and so maybe the you know the the game life Conway's game life is similar, uh, or and there are other examples, but the point now is how to connect it to 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 uh, to the Gedelian issues. And so let's look at the con again at the concept of the of a natural number, something that that is so natural to us. It's so natural uh, because it seems to us that then we have the you know the the, the zero and the and, and the operation of successor. Then the concept of the natural number is described, and as, as we know, we can you know this is just iteration. And, and as we know, this theory is decidable, and even if we have all, uh, addition. It's still decided up. This is the Pressburger arithmetic. This is, of course, well known. In fact, when you have only, only uh, 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 only multiplication, it is also decidable. But as we all know, when we have both multiplication, uh, addition, and multiplication, it stops being decidable. So this advent of undecidability as a consequence, consequence of one simple step consisting of piecing together multiplication and addition, I think it constitutes emergence in some sense. Because, you know, it's really so strange, so unexpected. And so, of course, now we, we have learned about it. We, to us, it seems so natural. We think that it's just how, the, how things are with the natural numbers. But, uh, but, uh, but that, that, does the fact that we have learned so much about models of arithmetic eliminate the initial surprise? I think that it does not. Maybe you may disagree, but, uh, uh, but it's really, you know, it's something that, that I think continues to be a, a sort of, surprise that that is so anyway so that means that the natural numbers just taken with addition and multiplication are such a complicated realm that uh, that it's very hard to know how to define them 
although we have very good definitions, the piano, arithmetic, and other, but as we know, it's insufficient. And this is one of those main issues that I will be coming back to from various angles. Uh, that uh, That is the problem. The problem is what our understanding of the numbers is. And uh, probably it seems that we have some, you know, background tacit knowledge that comes uh, from whatever biological evolution or, or or other sources whatever or from whatever it is but uh, it it is something that that can be called godelian emergence that has been uh, uh, with that we can be aware of due to godel's work and Gödel's uh, uh, methods. Uh, and this, and uh, okay, so, and some equa equation again, it's, it's, it's important that we have, we can have the, the undecidable sentence in this relatively simple form. Simple, of course, in, only in some sense, because it's very complicated in another sense. Uh, okay. So that's about emergence. Now the next points will be discussed in turn. So let's come to point two, which is Lucan's Penrose uh, the, uh, argument that human mind is not a machine. Well, this is wrong to put it in the simplest uh, terms uh, because Gödel's theorem alone is not sufficient for, for the proof or for the convincing proof of it. Uh, uh, so not 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 by by the by the Gödel's theorems alone. Uh, this is something that that, as I said, is is well known, and some perhaps some people can think that it's enough because enough has been said and no, nothing really should be added. Well, maybe after all, we can try to 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 say something more and especially because the we also ask the additional question namely do go Gödel's result imply limitations regarding our our abilities to mechanize intelligence right because um, um, and these are two questions that seem to be almost the same but uh, but no, they are not the same, which Gödel remarked in his 1951 uh, lecture, uh, namely that while uh, anti-mechanism is not implied, the, uh, the uh, our limitations are implied by uh, by Gödel's results. So to to have both. Uh, let me it's it's about something that uh, th that we can try to 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 define now the problem is that there are there is more than one way to demonstrate the error in the lucas or penrose arguments and uh, i think it's uh, it's a uh, fun so in some sense to quote john burgess who has expressed that rather well, although this is uh, not a very simple way of putting the, the, the problem. So let me read it. Uh, For some, the mistake lies in overlooking the possibility that it might in actual fact be the case that the procedure generates only mathematical assertions we can see to be true. Without our recommending a clear enough view, of what the procedure generates to enable us to see that this is the case. Okay, so this is just repeated. And for others, even if we do see that the procedure generates only mathematical assertions we think we see are true, it still might be rational to acknowledge human fallibility by refraining from concluding that the procedure generates only mathematical assertions that are in fact actual fact true well 
I think it we can we can say the same thing in a simpler way. First, it's not excluded that we are consistent machines, but do not know it. And secondly, it's not excluded that we are inconsistent machines. Of course, I'm not saying that we are machines and, uh, and even less I am saying that we are inconsistent machines, but uh, the point is that it's not excluded just by having Gödel's results or Gödel's techniques or our other or our knowledge um, uh, as as the argument, right? There may be other arguments or completely different character or our, our feelings that we are something else than machines and especially inconsistent machines, but who knows, who knows, right? We meaning our mind. Of course, this is the whole issue now, what, what it means. And some people say that it's so imprecise that it doesn't really make sense. Still, we can say various things. And anyway, you know, the qu quote by what Gödel said to Wang and was published by Wang first. Uh, well, this, this is so well known that perhaps it do doesn't really, yeah, I don't need to, to read it again because this is something everybody knows about. Okay, so let's, uh, let us uh, see, let me just give a, 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 a summary of the analysis of Lucas' argument and all such arguments. Basically, they consist of four steps. The first step is that L for Lucas, L1. We can see that machines are necessarily equivalent to, equivalent to formal systems, that this is the, like follows from the definition of a machine. Two, that the machine M models the mind, if it models the mind, then this is a quote from Lucas' uh, paper. It must include a mechanism which can enunciate truths of arithmetic. Three, we can use Gödel's technique to construct a formula which is not provable, uh, which is independent uh, of the uh, truths proved by that machine, or at least its arithmetical part. And of course, we assume that it is consistent. Uh, that that arithmetical part at least. And finally, we can see that the formula, uh, the Gödel's formula is true. We can see that, so we are better than is any machine. Now, of course, we can uh, analyze all those steps in various ways, but the best, basically L1 is is uh, basically L1 is, is, is about, uh, um, L1 was this, yes, was, uh, it's like, like Church's thesis basically, and it's something most of us would, would consider as, as uh, rather something we don't doubt, we don't really doubt much. So let's assume that we can uh, confirm the step one. Step two is that somehow the machine in, in, can uh, somehow produce truth of arithmetic. The point here is that the word truth is completely unnecessary here. And, uh, and uh, so, it, so in fact, it's not necessary. We can just say that the machine just has, has some way of indicating that some of the arithmetical statements are distinguished. We would say true, but they are just distinguished in some sense. And what the sense is, is, is here really not important. We say truth, they are true because it's for us, it's easier to, to deal, deal it with it this way, but this is not something that, that, that no real deep theory or understanding of truth is needed here. Uh, now, concerning the third step, we, uh, of course we can use Gödel's technique to construct a formula that is not provable, 
but assuming that the theory is consistent. And so we have those two cases, the case one theory as is consistent and there's good theory, theories as is inconsistent. The theory S is the theory of all those uh, statements that are distinguished by the machine. Let's think about arithmetical statements as true, yes, as those true or true in quotation marks, if you want. Uh, so the main here here is that uh, that Lucas and everybody and Penrose and everybody basically says, well, if it's inconsistent, then it's not good because after all, uh, you know, it's disqualified. Uh, such a machine would be disqualified as a model of the mind. Uh, but this is, seems to be uh, more tricky because after all, uh, 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 you know, we know from our experience, I think each of us, that sometimes we do contradict ourselves. We say something and then we say something opposite, not perhaps in the realm of arithmetic, but in, 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 in various human situations. Uh, well, well, we can say that we can overcome those inconsistencies by making things more precise, etc. That's of course true, but still the point whether we are fundamentally sound or not is, is consistent and sound is, is a real point as we can perhaps, you know, become or be trapped into inconsistency in a ways that are not uh, that obvious. And in fact, what I am going to show in a, a moment is that uh, Lucas himself and also Penrose himself uh, are, uh, have been trapped in this way just by formulating the arguments. Uh, um, and finally, the point four is that we can see that the formula, the Gödelian formula is true, that we can see that. Well, we can see that, of course, this is correct, but uh, um, the point is um, whether this is really something uh, that is not mechanical. And in fact, the point, I would say that it is pretty mechanical to see that this is true because you know we know how it is constructed and we know why we can say that this is true. Now to make it more uh, um, spe uh, what, specific or maybe more formal, let me, let me just mention that the distinction between case one and case two is, is not easy because it's not decidable uh, as is well known. And, and, uh, and then, and this is one of the main ways of refuting the, the argument. So let me, so because it's not decidable and so there is this, the whole issue with making which uh, Lucas and others do that this is a so-called dial dialectical argument, uh, namely uh, that if somebody claims that a machine is equivalent to the mind, then it is shown that to him that he falls into a contradiction. Uh, okay, we can do that, uh, but, uh, but, uh, because we, aha, we, and so and the argument that Lucas was adding after the criticism was made was that okay so uh, if somebody produces a an inconsistent machine as a proposal to to have uh, something to have a machine equivalent to the human mind then it is uh, it's, it's of course it's 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 bad, but it's but he the mechanist should produce only consistent machines. But if you assume that uh, that somebody can tell between the consistent and inconsistent machines 
uh, all, and can always decide correctly, then we assume that that, that person, that mechanist, has non-mechanical powers because the the then the set of um, num of indices of consistent machines is not uh, recursive uh, among the all the indices of uh, Turing machines. So 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 if you assume superhuman capa capabilities or no, at least non-mechanical capabilities, then of course we can prove the point, but the, but this then we assume the point rather than than then prove it. So it doesn't really help much. And uh, and in fact we can do more. Namely, we can uh, we can show that Lucas is inconsistent and Penrose is unsound just by giving a little argument and uh, but before we do it let me mention the necessary conditions for outgoing for each such uh, argument it's not not only lucas and and penrose this but also uh, all other arguments of the same character so i see four conditions that each mach first each machine proposed by the mechanism is equivalent to a Turing machine, and it is possible to exhibit one such machine. It's all uh, because it's not a, if it's not equivalent to a Turing machine, then of course it's something else. Then we can really do nothing, but that only that also would mean that that uh, um, that this is that we start with something which is by Church's thesis, not uh, mechanical. So, so, it, 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 so I, I think it, 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 that this, this is a rather natural condition. Of course, each of those conditions can be discussed, but uh, let me just go quickly. The second, the anti-mechanism must respond to every consistent machine, uh, at least. But to every consistent machine, he must respond. Uh, and in the case of Penrose, to every sound machine, machine that is that is sound. Three, the anti-mechanist's response consists in presenting a statement that is not provable by the machine. Uh, yes, we don't really not, we don't even need to say to say that this must be a true statement or in any sense, in any sense of the term. It must just be not provable by the machine. And the condition four, the response to the machine is effectively determined in advance because there must be a way to do it uh, in an effective way because other, and of course, in all those examples, real life examples, I mean, Lucas and Penrose arguments, it's always a Gödel's, a Gödel's sentence constructed in a standard way, which is, and given as the response. So of course it's effectively determined in advance, given the machine or the, the, the response is produced. And, uh, uh, this is, and this is algorithmic as we know. And the fact that this is algorithmic is one of the, the, the weakest, so to say, point, points, weakest points of the whole arguments of Lucas or Penrose uh, variety. So more formally, if you have the listing of all Turing machines and S of a machine is the, it's arithmetical theory of a machine. And we have a function which corresponds to this condition for the, the, the giving the, the, the example, yes, giving the response. is defined for some natural numbers, considered as indices of the Turing machines with values that are arithmetical formulas so that f is partial recursive to have uh, f the domain of f con has all the consistent machines c is for consistent c mean c is the set of consistent in uh, machines like the, the, the set of n so that m n is consistent and for each such machine, Fn does not belong to, to this theory of the nth machine. 
So if you have such a, a function, which is a formalization of the conditions, the four conditions that I just uh, uh, indicated, then we have the inconsistency theorem. That is the set of values of F is an inconsistent. It's simply inconsistent. So uh, the, the proof of it is rather standard. I would just, the, the slides will be available to everybody anyway later. It's a, it's a standard proof. And uh, so we can, so the point is now that, that, that uh, and this is like the far reaching uh, uh, strengthening of the observation made much before, of course, uh, by Wang and others, that, that there is no effective, this, the possibility of to effectively distinguish between case one and case two, consistent and, non -cons and inconsistent uh, theories. And nothing about truth is mentioned here at, yes. Now, so the consequences is either the mind is not a machine, I would say, and there are, so there are no Gödelian limitations on it, or B, the mind is a machine and is inconsistent, and then no limitations based on Gödel's theorem would apply. Or finally, C, the mind is a machine which is consistent, and it cannot then prove the Gödelian formula for the machine, or what is to say, for itself. Now, uh, so this is how, how, uh, so this is what we, what we get. Now, uh, there is a, a very nice fantasy by Rudy Rooker about robots on the moon. Robots on the moon, there is a whole civilization of robots on the moon and they develop. And we can imagine that there will be a robot. Let's just imagine a robot is born, called him Luke, whose mathematical capabilities are exactly equivalent to those of Lucas. Or if you want, you know, to, to anybody else or to the whole humankind, you know, theoretically considered as potential, potentially or, or whatever else you want. But anyway, think about him as a as a as con uh, equivalent to to to, to uh, Lucas, and so he would be, and it's it's possible to imagine such a robot, and and to, so Luke would be able to say to do exactly the same argument as Lucas did, and. Uh, uh, and would be able to to produce the sa exactly the same the same argument by doing exactly the same, and because everything is uh, is um, basically um, uh, it's it's either formal it's formal and uh, and mechanical in fact uh, the pro pro the producing the response. Uh, to the to the whatever is pro proposed by the other, so uh, so that's that's uh, so the Lucas argument doesn't work, and in fact Penrose's version is very similar, but it's uh, Penrose uh, uh, considered just sound theories, not just, not consistent, but sound theories, but a very similar uh, version uh, can be done. I won't go into details, uh, but it's, it's very similar for sound machines and uh, similar uh, conditions. We can have the unsoundness theorem that is the set of values of, of, the, of the, all those responses. It's a partial recursive function, but response for all sound machines as for sound. Uh, the set of values is unsound which can be said that Penrose, now famous because of Nobel Prize and really a great mind, a great mathematician and great uh, scientist, uh, no, he, um, he, uh, 
he be, believes that that the, uh, that he can, that he, as 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 Patnam put it, that he has a uh, dispute with the logical community. It's uh, unfortunately, it's not. His argument is not good enough. Uh, and in fact, the the, the 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 proof is almost the same, and changing all the, the mutatis mutandi is the same. And uh, and uh, Yong Chen remarked that this can be even further generalized, uh, uh, which is nice. But anyway, the I would say that the the ans the answer to the question that Penrose put in his second book. Uh, the question was, do mathematicians unwittingly use an unsound algorithm? And he was, of course, was implying that they don't. And so the, 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 the question, the, the answer to this question seems to be positive, namely, sometimes they do. For example, Penrose himself. Now, to somehow also uh, the point, the point is that uh, that I think there is a way to some so to say save Penrose to say but uh, this requires some additional assumptions that he has probably uh, assumed as obvious in an uncritical way. So let's see how it works. The lack of awareness that might be a problem that cannot be understood by us, I think, is the is the weak point of Penrose's considerations. Uh, because what he said was that either T is known, T is the theory that is supposed to be to, to be equivalent to the mind, and we know it is equivalent, or T is known and we do not know it. Or T is not known. There are three possibilities that we the, basically that he considered, and uh, in in the second possibility, this is like a summary of Penrose's argument. Of course, very rough, but I think fair. In two, T is known, but we do not know that it is equivalent to the mind. It is tacitly assumed that if T is known, that T must be fully graspable. This is his. This is this weak point. But no, in fact, we can be faced with a complete description of a program. We still have no idea what it does, and this is by basically something that is almost, almost should be almost obvious by now. So the say to save Penrose's approach, we need an additional assumption. Namely, something that that uh, really he does, namely that the putative algorithm, the one that is supposedly you know equivalent to the mind, is the one actually used by mathematicians. Then we may refer to the fact that mathematics is built from simple and obvious ingredients, as Penrose wrote. So he disregards the possibility of a hidden algorithm, something that arose, you know, in uh, some evolution of robots and uh, was part and is part of look of this robot look on the moon, who is com uh, 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 equivalent, say, to Penrose, whose mind is equivalent to Penrose's mind, at least as far as the arithmetical consequences, arithmetical theorems are concerned. And uh, so, uh, and this is something he disregarded because he assumed somehow that everything is built from simple ingredients upwards. And this is what we do as human mathematicians, of course. But uh, he assumed that there is no other way for an algorithm to appear. And this is this mistake. So I would say that this mistake is a perfectly natural for a mathematician who just assumes that everything is done the way we know it is done in mathematics as we know it. But it looks rather naive from 
the logician's perspective because we know that those uh, uh, theories or uh, algorithms can appear in very very different ways now there is also the whole issue with the new argument but i would uh, i would perhaps uh, i don't think it's basic i will skip it because the 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 problem lies with the assumption that we know that the mind is sound in some sense uh, we know it no is a strong sense because we have the Gödel unknowability thesis and perhaps i would like to 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 go to it uh, because the time is not as uh, comprehensive as i thought it would be the time for the lecture so uh, so Gödel's unknowability thesis is um, is that we cannot uh, unassailably, to use the term used by Penrose, demonstrate our own consistency, let alone soundness. It's important to assume that, to know that we do assume our consistency or soundness here. Gödel did say that, and the point is whether it can be uh, proved in some way. Of course, it's, uh, you know, some people try to interpret this as, as a, as a, uh, uh, um, as a formal statement, but it's not a formal statement. It's, it's something about our consistency. And the argument is rather simple. If we can demonstrate in a mathematical way something then it means that we have we are able to express that to somehow uh, mathematically formally and then to do an, a math mathematical kind of a proof and this we as logicians we know it all can be then uh, somehow uh, formalized and that would you know do lead to something that would um, uh, contradict the second, the, the second Gödel's theorem. This is basically how we do it. The, the, we can do it uh, in an abstract form, the whole, the thesis, uh, which is basically that, uh, that uh, if we assume the consistency and, and, uh, and that uh, no ability uh, be denoted by B, then the standard Leib, Leib con Leib's conditions uh, are un enable us to derive in inconsistency. So this is um, so, but of course this is something well known basically and of course also mentioned in various ways uh, even in the uh, previous lecture uh, by Folk. So let me then go to the issue that I think is interesting in and somehow does draw on many of the topics that I mentioned before. I would call it the implementation assignment, namely that we as human programmists say uh, are in the project of programming our notion of natural numbers so, so that we, we can put it in the into a computer or a robot uh, so that we can do it. And of course, we feel or we seem to know what natural numbers are. Tiano's axioms are a very good way to define them. But as we know from Gödel, this is not enough. So, and I mentioned already that this can lead us to the doubt whether doubting whether you know the concept of a natural number is at all uh, good good enough but uh, it seems that what if, if, if even if it's good enough 
it seems that we are not able to do it formally in a way that would really uh, be equivalent to to uh, to so, so that it would express our understanding of, of numbers uh, uh, we cannot fully define our understanding of numbers if if, if this is correct then no computer can be taught by us our concept of a number. Of course, again, this computer robot or whatever can theoretically arise in some other way, but this would be, uh, uh, you know, a robot that is has the equivalent concept of natural numbers in some sense, but we wouldn't know that and we wouldn't be able to know this so that's that's this very strange and rather uh you know frightening possibility that there is a, a machine equivalent to us but we don't know it and we are not in a not and we wouldn't know we cannot know there is no way we can know it uh, uh, I would let me mention now that you know in in his comments, Yong Cheng, uh, the organizer of this conference, in a comment on on this issue, he claimed that what I was trying to say in my paper was that no ax complete axiomatic system can fully characterize all truths about natural numbers. But this is not what I meant. I meant our notion of natural numbers. The point is how to characterize our notion. It's not, it's not a question about the, some theories that we can say that this theory is good, you know, the Pressburg arithmetic is, is uh, decidable and the piano arithmetic is undecidable and this and that. No, I don't mean that. I mean that we have a certain concept of a natural number and we tell it to, we somehow teach our children, our, our students, what it is. And so it's, we seem to have a, a notion, but, but is it, is it uh, uh, a notion that is good enough? Is it really clear enough? Is it, this is the, this is the problem. And it seems that there are some limitations here that are really do have an impact. On our on our possibilities of programming, our concept, our notion, our grasp, our feeling what natural numbers is are, and I think we have this feeling and this grasp very clearly inside with us. Okay, now a few remarks. I still have five minutes or six minutes about the what I call practical irrelevance of Gödelian limitations. Here, uh, so the, so as we know, look is theoretically possible. Of course, practically, it's, I'm not saying that it's a practical possibility that such a robot would arise in some way, not programmed by us, but in some other way. Although, well, who knows? But, but it means more. First, there are, idealizations and there's a idealizations and the the issue of idealizations is very rather um, developed by people like Wang then Shapiro and Kölner and others and uh, and uh, so they basically they say that you know all those idealizations that we have unlimited time for or we have unlimited um, uh, memory or the no mistakes all those and when this we see this as as an uh, idealization of the human mind that it seems very strange because we humans have of course limited lifespans energy memory and uh, etc et so so uh, this is a, a problem and really you know uh, based on that, for example, Kölner said that 
the state that the statement the mind can be mechanized or that there are absolutely undecidable statements are so indefinite that it doesn't really make much sense to to deal with them or they are definite but they are and then they are examples of absolutely undecidable propositions maybe there is some sort of vague, vagueness uh, used in the lucas pendrel's arguments uh, still we can say that uh, have an, a charitable interpretation that uh, is to accept the possibility of procedures of the kind deployed by Lucas and, and, and Penrose and then the show refutations as, as, I, uh, as I did with those state statements. Uh, but then there is another issue. Uh, uh, Arnon, uh, um, Arnon Avron, who, who is also with us, and I am happy, uh, mentioned that there are so many ambiguities in the way you know we express uh, all those uh, issues that uh, is very problematic to uh, to say what was really meant and so what we can should do is always to to formalize be, and when before it's fully formalized the the issue is not clear enough and we cannot really uh, know what it uh, what it means but uh, mm -hmm. so for example the human mind or is the idealized human mind or the humanly accessible arithmetical theorems that these are uh, and these are terms are needed for the anti mechanist thesis and all those discussions but uh, they are too indefinite now uh, but uh what my response to this is this for the following this can this position can be dangerous to mathematicians who say that themselves first of all you know it's not clear that everything can be formalized that every mathematical argument can be formalized of course much can be formalized and we have learned that but it's it's not that completely clear that everybody everything can what is more important is that formalization is an art. That is some creativity is required when we formalize. It's not unique. And it, in fact, Folger's uh, paper was a good example of intentionality, which is part of the, of the issue. But it's, so it's partly an intuitive pre-formal issue, which remain, remains as, the, as part of the whole situation. And it's an illusion that formalization can solve all of problems. But there is more to that. Namely, I mean, there is an additional argument. Namely, the, um, and it's even more, more, more uh, connected to, to Gödel's uh, proof. Namely, people who, 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 um, who are the critics, who say that it's too ambiguous and doesn't really, we don't really know what it is about. They freely use concepts like the set of natural numbers or the true, the set like truth, the set of all true arithmetical statements, etc. But as we have mentioned, uh, remarked already uh, so often uh, um, during this lecture, the, those concepts are perhaps not clear at all. Perhaps there is no one realm of natural numbers because it's not predetermined. And also it depends on various facts, including our beliefs in the consistency of complicated formal theories like large cardinal axioms, uh, which are have the reflection in the absence or presence of the existence of solutions of some equation, their fontaine equations. So that's why, uh, you know, uh, if there is, if our concept of the natural numbers is unclear, then it would uh, mean that that all the ma mathematical considerations, including formalization of them, are uh, you know just a game, 
I'm not saying I believe that, but this is a, one of the positions, philosophical positions that is being developed more and more uh, uh, comprehensively. Uh, and there is, there are no natural numbers. It's just our idea or our imagination of the natural numbers rather than natural numbers as a, uh, as a uh, reality that we refer to when we put, you know, the capital, uh, the N, the capital uh, number, uh, letter N for natural numbers or the set of all true arithmetical statements. Uh, the, now, now the, it's well known that the anti-mechanist argument does not convince anyone, anyone, while one way or the other way, and that's something that has been remarked by various people. So let me just uh, the the Gödel's number Gödel numbers are too big to have practical uh, practical relevance. I think this is true, although this may may some some very um, uh, you know, special Gödel numbers perhaps can overcome that. The, the next point with, with uh, relevance, practical relevance is that Gödel's sentence has no clear meaning within the theory for which it is constructed because it has an only meta-mathematical meaning as we know. But uh, I have an additional point to, uh, about this and I will be finishing in a moment. Namely, consider something which is related to it, the well-known Tarski's theorem. But the fact is that the, we, we don't have the formal definition of, uh, the, of truth in, uh, say, arithmetic, but we have a formal definition of sigma 1 truth or sigma 50 truth. Uh, and so the large, a large chunk of truth can be formally defined as we know, although this is also intentional problem with intentionality exists, but basically yes, and they are using methodological arguments, but they are not used in any in any other arguments than than logical ones. So, for example, uh, so the point is here that we can imagine, you know, the not not that we can imagine. We can say that we have the formal definition. Of, of the arithmetical statements which have co quantifiable complexity less than 10 to 10 to 10 to 10. And that I think that it is, it is fair to say that we will never consider statement, arithmetical statements that are more complicated, we human humans. But this means that we have a formal through definition for all statements that can possibly be mentioned by human mathematicians. So what? It doesn't really help in any sense because this formal definition doesn't have any practical significance. If so, maybe the maybe Tarski's theorem that there is no formal definition for all arithmetical sentences also has no philosophical uh, meaning or philosophical significance because you know if they are, if having a large chunk of truth formalized doesn't so why should the fact that the whole cannot be done uh, should be so so important and finally this is really the final point that the Gödelian sentence is even more irrelevant for physics theories of law etc because they tried various people tried to use Gödel's technique for showing that there is no theory of everything or there is no formal way of expressing law that law in a sense in the sense that would make everything every sentence follow formally but of course it seems to be just unnecessary because what is important are the the independent sentences that are really part of the field and not constructed by Gödelian techniques. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.